they found. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was young at the time, but when it happened, I knew things would never be the same. Me and two of my men were doing our best to hold the lines. I can still hear the ricochet and the bounces. It's like I'm still there. Sometimes I think I'm seeing things from that day. As we tried to keep fighting, struggling in the mud of our own decaying. Cars whipping through the air. Bounces smashing my earbuds. Boost exhausting my temper. The timer inexorably going down. It was a long fight, but what a fight. I remember thinking of those things in a flash, and then, out of nowhere, it had started. Our enemy took the ball and turned right towards the wall. This is it. This is the end. From one second to the next, it was in the air, right under the ball. But this was not some normal. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting emotional. You have to understand it from my perspective. I've never seen that in my life. What he was wasn't human for me at the time. He didn't just carry the ball. This was not some random air dribble. He was twirling and twisting like a tornado. The kind of tornado to which you don't want to be near. The kind that frightens you because it reminds you that there is a god above us, all powerful, all knowing, and you're nothing but a tiny piece of dust floating through life, hoping not to be driven up his nose by the wind, for then he would sneeze the world to its end. And so he turned and turned and twisted and swirled, intoxicating all of us with his skills, his majestic, beautiful skills, pure magic. It was like seeing the divine. standing to hold the fort and I would fight with my life to preserve peace and victory. When that realization hit me I thought to myself no I will not go down that easily. I'm mesmerized but I'm still living and until that ball goes into my goal I'll defend it with my life. And then... <laughs> Sorry this is very emotional for me. And then... Flip reset. <laughs> that was my first encounter with a Smurf, and that was my first encounter with directional arrow. What the heck is directional air roll? Directional air roll is a flying mechanic used by many, which consists in giving one constant rolling input to your car, while on the other hand, freely concentrating your directional inputs to control your car in the air. It is very impressive, paradoxically very fluid, much harder to read for the opponent, and mostly, very mostly, and I still can't stress that enough, it gives you a shit ton of freedom in the game, which includes much, much more fun and satisfaction. 
While using this mechanic, your car will constantly roll on its longitudinal axis, your lengthwise axis. This one? Not this one. It's the axis going from the butt to your car to the head of your car, the same axis your car uses when you're side flicking. Directional air roll, as its name suggests, requires you to only go one direction. This means using left directional air roll or right directional air roll rather than normal air roll, which is this. You will have to make this choice and it is totally arbitrary as much as doing a one-handed backhand in tennis or a two-handed backhand is. Neither is better than the other and your choice will go where the preference of what you feel or what you see will go. I personally use left air roll. Again, I don't know why I just chose it as soon as I decided to learn. I'll only talk about left air roll as right air roll is the symmetrical opposite and you'll have if you choose to go for right air roll to do that on your own as one side is already quite hard to explain as you will see later. So while pressing my left air roll button I will start flying my car and she will be constantly rotating left like a tornado or a cork or a pig in the mud whatever sits your boots if it fits the image. This is directional air roll. So what do people think about directional air roll? Well, that's one hell of a debate, yeah? While many say you don't need it to be good at the game, not only will I say I disagree, I'll also just say these people are either people who can't air roll and talk without experience, or they are directional air roll users and have gained an extremely big amount of level, whether it be mechanical or vision-wise, ever since they started using it and now have focused on different mechanics or, again, better vision and speed, leaving their air roll so natural that they just take it for granted. They can't seem to remember how bad they used to be before they learned how to use it. What actually happened to them is that more than unlocking their mechanical skill cap, they have also unlocked, thanks to air roll, a better, wider vision of the game less tunnelly, making them all around better players. Why? Because they can put less energy into not missing that simple ball in the air and more into, okay, that's my turn to go P3. You know, let's not forget that these people talk about the game as though ranked games and your relo was the only reference to what being good at the game is. And again, I'll come back to this with my own opinion. Another thing is that although many YouTubers have tried to teach it, none of them have taken the time and dedication to go in depth and in the end they just make the same video over and over again promising you to give you the secret of error when they never actually do. And I'm referencing a very specific YouTuber here. All but one. One guy on YouTube has made a video and I'll put the link in the description. I, I hope it doesn't mind because he's literally the only one to speak the truth about it. This guy, apart from me now, is the only guy who wants you to know how to air roll. Listen to him. So to come back to what people think about directional air roll, other people will actually say that it's unteachable and that only empiricism, which is another word for experience, can teach you. In other words, fuck. In other words, they'll claim that there's no specific method except for time, and that you will learn it in hundreds of hours, ranging from 200 to maybe 700 hours. No, 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 no. And here I go saying, I believe this is bullshit. There are a few things that I consider wrongly believed about this game, for instance, the sport of Rocket League, and that includes your ranked games, is different from the actual game. Another example would be, directional air roll is not unteachable, but the way some self-proclaimed coaches of the game teach it is just not truthful. First of all, if we can make all the things we can as human beings, surely we can find a way to analyze what is going on while air rolling in this wonderful but yet on a much bigger scheme, simple hobby. After all, it's a video game. So to me, either people are being dishonest about their willing to teach it, 
keeping the knowledge more or less of a secret so that they can just keep baiting us into clicking on their new tutorial video, which anyhow is not going to find by me, for if teaching should be financially rewarded, knowledge should be free to anyone or at least freely accessible. Or if you want to have faith in universal idealism, we can hope that they just don't know how to teach it properly. This would then mean that amongst the best of the best, and among those best, the ones who wish they could teach it, no matter how talented it might be, they would still have not found a proper way to put all the pieces of information together in order to make a clear, neat guide about how to learn directional air roll. Those same talented people who, thanks to their mechanical level, have with these skills only been given by the game, the sport and the audience the legitimacy to properly say that a flying mechanic such as directional air roll is not only an essential part of Rocket League, but its reference as far as air control is concerned. In other words, not only is it an essential part of the game, it's also just how flying is supposed to be done. So the question is, why has no one been able to explain and teach air roll? Why has no one made a method yet? I have my own answer, which is as follows. Because a method is rarely, if not ever, based on an error, an incorrect definition or idea, or, as we will see later on, a false constant or incorrect constant. Why then would I imply that there is an error? Because everybody, from players to developers, mistake the reality of the concept of the game, which is car football with the truth of the idea of the game, which is, to me, remotely controlled juggling. In order to fully contemplate this idea, let's talk about something that one might consider philosophy. Don't be scared, you don't need a PhD or to be Plato to understand this. Let's talk about an idea and a concept. Those two words are generally taken for granted, such as reality and truth, because they work as siblings. To be blunt, a concept is always the subject of an idea. The idea is the father or the mother of many concepts which follow them and make them take place in reality. Here's a simple example. To move many people quickly and at the same time from one place to another? That's an idea. The concept? Public transports. It's important to know that there is never a concept with no idea, as the idea is what I want and the concept is how do I get it. I'm hungry is the idea. I'm going to make myself some pasta is a concept, as much as I'm going to go out and go to McDonald's is another concept. One doesn't usually think about a way to get something without wanting that something first. How do I get more money is an idea. Creating my new startup is a concept, such as playing lottery, becoming a pro poker player, stealing, marrying a rich person, becoming a famous YouTuber slash streamer, which is quite a modern concept, obviously, or actually working hard and with honesty, which is not the simplest, but the one which has the most win rate per se, if I want to keep speaking as a gamer, you get the idea, pun intended. Now, this is why I say people are wrong about the game. Psionics created a concept, car soccer, but mistook it for an idea, actual Rocket League. Let's take a step back for a minute. This is going to be the rant section of the video. What is my problem? In the last few months, there's been something off with the game. Ever since it went free to play, people have come to play it a lot and suddenly quit it. Psyonix has even made the choice to remove the number of online players with a simple OK, super great ladder. And if this is not being scared that people would start considering the game dead, I don't know what is. Also, there's nothing, nothing more frustrating as a new player to be told that in order to have fun at the game, you'll have to try hard your life out of it. Take hundreds of hours to learn something, then another couple hundred hours to implement it in the game, and two last hundreds to actually be consistent. There is nothing more frustrating than seeing mechanical moves made by pros and other talented people and knowing you will never, never be able to do the same, even remotely. So people stop playing the game, unless they fall in love with it, like I did, and many others. I've been playing tennis since I was six. I'll never be Fedra, and that's fine, because I can at least hit the ball well enough to have fun in the sport, but this does not translate to Rocket League.
Unless you're stuck to the ground or do some shitty aerials, the game itself tells us that we will never succeed. How Psyonix has not seen all that I'm talking about is beyond me and how they've never ever done anything to teach some current aerial movements such as directional air rule is also beyond me. The reason I'm the one to do it also is beyond me. People deserve to be given knowledge, especially by the ones who create the game. Gamers will never, ever, ever put that much time into learning unless they are helped. They will switch to other games, leaving the current one full of passionate players who literally play almost nothing else. I doubt this is how a game thrives. This is how it survives, but surviving isn't truly living, is it? Please, God, is it? Is it? I'm good. I am good. I'm good. My belief is that if people were given the chance to learn correctly, in a few years, Rocket League would literally be a family-friendly game like freaking Monopoly is, in the sense that it holds in itself so much richness and potential anyone would want to play it. The same way the majority of the population uses Facebook or Twitter, the way that Twitch is now the main streaming service people use to both stream and watch games, discussions, workers doing their craft, etc. We can also talk about all the bugs in the game, such as the famous my teammate left the group for no reason, or the infamous my teammate forfeited the tournament, so did I, I then quit the game and for some reason I'm considered a lever, a quitter, and I'm therefore banned from playing tournaments, as well as the simple but not less uh, annoying shitty servers here and there. And don't get me started on the fact that we don't even have a hitbox for every car, how shitty is that? Or finally, the infinite amount of unfairness in the items, whether it's because they're just shitty in general, or that you use all your 12k tournament points to get something as shitty as a level 15 rocket pass user would get. I don't find it normal that all we care about is having white titanium octanes. Do you? The simple fact that other players and content creators such as Backess, who gave us his wonderful mod to fool around with and learn much quicker, thanks to the fast respawns of the ball for instance, or Lethemir, who's created more than a hundred maps which are not only on the scheme of car sucker map, can help us realize that if the game we have can be played on other maps than the sucker looking map which has been decided to be the reference game mode, Rocket League is not, in its essence, car sucker. It was just chosen so, without thinking, in order to get the pro gamers and the eSport going after super acrobatic rocket power battle cars was updated to the game that we now have and which needed regulated rules and maps to make an eSport career possible out of it. This was the rant part as well as a clarification that I didn't see any content creators ranting about when the game was dying a few months ago, talk about or just even realize. By the way, being a pro player or a talented freestyler by no way means that you know what the game needs or what the casual player feels, far from it. Take it from someone who's neither a pro nor especially talented but still knows how to use directional air rule. By the way, number two, being able to play any custom maps with your friends easily, which is a dream of mine, will not also ever be fun if nobody but you can actually have fun in the air. It's not enough to say we need more content in the game. It's not enough for content creators to say we need more maps from Psyonix or we need more events. If there is never enough content to make people play the game, maybe it's because the game is unplayable, especially without the right idea of what it is, which is my point, and without a minimum of the fun mechanics that I believe anyone should be taught to enjoy it, hence this video. And to the content creators, I'm sorry to say that, but personally, I find the videos more boring than ever. It is not totally your fault, but it kind of is. If you can be passionate about something and still be wrong about it, to me, the fault is also yours. You can't be that blind. You have your own role and responsibility in this. You can't just wash and repost the same old videos over and over again. You can't just watch other content creators' videos and make a video which is just you commenting on the other content creators' video. How is that not boring? Had you had the same idea as me when I say the game is just not about foot car, 
and that there's an actual dire need to teach anyone you can about at least directional air roll in an honest and exhaustive fashion, you would have much more content to work with. I can guarantee it because many more people would be playing the game. Many more people would want to create their own maps and that would be a great thing for you. Too many videos claim to teach how to air roll but then tell you some easy shit that your own logic would get to at some point and that doesn't help you in the slightest as far as mechanical abilities are concerned. Like, oh, you have to get to the ball and you have to get the ball to the wall, then boost a little and then jump and just catch the ball in the air while air rolling. Holy mother, that's so easy. I never thought of it. And then they proceed to say, I can't really teach you about how to air roll. This is something you're going to have to figure out for yourself. I did a great impression of someone here. And then they ask you to leave a like and subscribe while still promising you in the next video that they will tell you the secret on how to air roll like a pro and still never, ever say anything remotely close to what it actually is. Just watch some of those videos and check for yourself the correlation between the number of views and the likes slash dislikes on it. It's clear that the information given not only is useless, it's also straight up insulting. In fact, I know one of them, a rather young fella whom I won't call out, but you'd feel aimed at for I've already referenced him once so far, who literally promises in every of his air roll videos that he's going to teach us how to do it, but then simply repeats over and over again how to turn left and right, which he still manages to incorrectly present. People want to air roll because it's fun, it's good looking, they believe it's going to make them feel better about themselves in the game and they're right and this is how pros play the game. And in any sport or activity, the pros are the ones who make the reference, the status quo of what physical and or intellectual abilities are and how this activity or sport should be executed. If I see all the pros air roll, it means to me and hopefully everybody that air rolling is how the game should be played. Pro players, the most talented players in the game, are also the one who dictates how to play it. Keep in mind that this game was not supposed to be playing on the ground. This is not FIFA. Otherwise, we wouldn't have gravity or boost. But also keep in mind that flying straight up with barely any control or feeling is just also not the right way to do it and will eventually make you quit as you realize you'll never do anything better. To me, that is mostly why the game is so-called dying, not any other reason. Give the players the knowledge to accomplish things they find mesmerizing so they get satisfaction from playing the game because no, your rank and playing around games is not going to keep the passion burning. On the other hand, getting actually good is always better than winning some meaningless games and points that will vanish at your next losing streak because with no skill, winning a game is basically more or less just a fluke. If you're good enough, you will not ping pong between wins and losses until you get the rank you actually deserve according to your level. No more excuses. All right, now let me take a step away from the necessary rant and a step further into this video by acknowledging something which ensues from the latter and penultimate arguments. Rocket League is by definition a video game, but by essence, a skill game, a toy. Why do I say so? Why do I believe I'm right? Why do I believe it should, as soon as possible, for the sake of the game status and the gamers, be validated? Here we go. Firstly, quickly going on the same line as my former chapter, the game of Rocket League as we know it and as it is competitively played is in my opinion just one of the many concepts of the game, of its actual idea and thus bigger potential. As far as number of players and playability is concerned, which is why Rocket League is currently stuck for the reasons that I gave just before this very chapter. Essentially that content creators seem to be out of breath for content, but still looking for that like and subscribe, we can't blame them, we want to live off of it. And also because the game is stuck in the player base numbers, because not enough people can get good enough to start having fun and wanting to try harder a bit more. Highly mechanical and ranked player excluded from this point, as my point literally is that if anyone knew how to air roll without having to try hard the game for years and hundreds of hours, Rocket League would be as big as League of Legends in terms of streaming, esport production and fame, player base, etc. League of Legends being perhaps one of the best references one could make comparisons with. 
As far as this video is concerned though, the theory is the idea, the concept is the method. Keep faith, we're almost there. Now for the actual point of this chapter I wish to make, what is a skill game and why is Rocket League one of them? Well, the simple definition which you could find on Wikipedia would be, and I quote the French wiki on that, a skill game is a game that values the player's dexterity and the outcome is decided by this latter. As I previously stated, I believe the idea, or the essence to use the word correctly, of Rocket League is remotely controlled juggling. In other words, a skill game. The main point of a skill game is that its gameplay relies solely on the player's mechanics and the map or the real word terrain has no influence on the gameplay whatsoever. If I juggle in my room, I can also juggle in the elevator and the street, in a classroom, in my shower if I can manage, you get the picture. One of the best examples I could think of while reflecting on this was skateboarding. You could do skateboard tricks in the streets, on the pavement, in your living room, in a skate park. Basically, wherever you can stand on your board can also be an opportunity for you to do some tricks. If I can play Rocket League in a foot car map or hoops or in aerial trainings or a rings map, as long as I have my car in the ball, which you don't have in rings, but the car control mechanics are sufficient in this case, then it means to me that it's a skill game because the terrain is subject to the gameplay. The gameplay being the idea that car and ball control are more important mechanics than the map shape or size or the way in which scoring is done. Case in point, one might never ever play current real games in foot car mode, but only be either a freestyler or only play custom slash training map, such as Eversax or Rings map, and still consider themselves as playing Rocket League. If you play tennis, I'm sticking with the same example that I know of, you can't consider you play tennis because you love training serves of volley. That's training in order to play. It's not actually playing, for that you would at least need a court. In Rocket League, you can consider having gameplay by just playing training custom maps. Let me rephrase all of this in a nutshell. A skill game has its gameplay live and not only evolve through the player's level of mechanical control. If it's self-sufficient, it's a skill game. The environment should be adding to what you do, not constraining it. Rocket League couldn't be a better example of this, and to enlighten this point, I'll just finish by saying three analogies again with skateboarding. First, that to me, directional air roll is as important as the ollie if you want to start doing tricks. Obviously, I'm talking about flat skateboarding, not vertical. If you can't ollie, how are you going to be good at kickflips? Second, that you hear the same streak of combos in Rocket League as you can hear in another skill game or sport. For instance, here's a ceiling pogo, plan B catch into air dribble, musty flick, backboard, flip reset goal. Ça va mettre presque impossible, simplement. On va juste faire le, le plan B catch comme ça, avec un monsieur backboard reset. That's from Rocket League. And in skateboard, here's a double flip nose manual, shove it manual, front shove out. It has less words in it, but it's probably as hard to make. And here's some more clips of skateboard. Ah, uh, this is this. I don't know what this is. This is this. Yes. That's impressive. That's cool. That's impressive and cool. And that just actually hurt my ankles finally that the same amount of satisfaction comes from landing your first directional air roll air dribble or air drag or your first flip reset as there is when landing your first ollie or kickflip on a skateboard. This leads me to one of the most important points of my incoming theory slash method. Feeling. Getting close to the method now as we're going to finish up with this almost theoretical part of the video by talking about a paramount point, feeling. Not only does it prove my former point that Rocket League is a skill game, but it is the core of the method I invented and will share with you right after this paragraph. This last point I want to make is so that we keep understanding one another. Me, the guy in the video giving information, and you, the person on the other side of the screen, receiving this information. In order to go into the method, let's lay down right now the fact that we will create our own terminology. 
terminology, if you're not sure what it means, is basically a dictionary full of lexical fields, jargons used to enunciate and define words, ideas, notions in a clear, repeatable and recognizable way for a specific subject. It is made to ensure and or enhance communication. We will enhance create together our own terminology so that you always know what I'm talking about or what I'm merely referencing. Yeah? All right, good. First of all, apart from some coaches who miss the right calling, many people agree to say that you cannot learn every single input of your joystick, and I would agree with them. Let's say for the sake of the argument that the joystick is a circle and we can divide the circle into eight equal parts, up, down, left, right, and the diagonals, that's eight parts for the joystick and also eight parts for the rotation that the car does when you're air rolling. Add to that the different perspective that you get when you're using ball cam and you can simply understand how wrinkled your brain's gonna be. So that's what a few hundreds of hours of learning by heart would give you, which is called empiricism. And I'm not sure I'm willing to do that. Are you? So let's finish this up by listening one last time to a philosophical saying by Immanuel Kant this time. Experience without theory is blind, but theory without experience is mere intellectual play. In Rocket League, we would go the other way around. Theory without experience is mere intellectual play. That's what I've been doing all this time. But experience without theory is blind, and that's what many players have been doing for so long in the game. We're going to use both experience and theory. And we're going to try to do it the right way, which is the smart way, which is using both. Do you know what? Just for the heck of it, let's take a closer look into what the car does in the air while pressing air roll and your joystick. Get something to drink that will allow you to focus while not being frustrated because this is going to hurt a little. I would suggest chamomile tea with a bit of lemon juice and honey. Tornado spin and reverse tornado spin. Let's talk about those. Many people have done videos about them. Many people have talked about them in a very specific way. But at the same time, to me, they all kind of say the same thing. I'm going to talk about this in a more detailed fashion. A tornado spin is just the action of using your right part of the joystick and keeping the input there. All right. As soon as you change the input, it's not per se a tornado spin. Second important note, as soon as you use air roll, the joystick is going to respond as though your car was tilted. So if you don't use air roll and you put your joystick up, your nose is going to go down like a plane, yeah? But as soon as you use air roll, just because you put your joystick up does not mean that your car is going to go down because you're already giving a turning input to your car. And I'm saying input in the sense that, well, if you use air roll at first, well, your car is not going to be facing the same way, meaning the top part of your car is going to be facing left and the bottom part of your car is going to be facing right. So if you try to go down, you're not going to go down to the ground anymore. Now, in order to talk about this, we will divide our joystick into two single parts, the bottom part and the top part. We'll look at it generally, and just right after this, we'll look at it a little bit more into detail. Now, the top part of your joystick, from top right to top left, will make your car go to the right if you keep the input while you're boosting. All of these inputs will lock your back left wheel and your front right wheel. The bottom part of your joystick, from down right to down left, will make your car go to the left if you keep the input while you're boosting. All of those three inputs will lock your back right wheel and your front left wheel. So we can already see a symmetry in this. It's as though your car was cut from one angle of a rectangle to the far symmetrical opposite. Back left, front right, and back right, front left. All right? Now, if you put your joystick to the far right and the far left, otherwise known as tornado spin and reverse tornado spin, it'll make you go straight. Those two inputs lock absolutely no wheels, as though your car was cut right in the middle of its length axis. This is why you go straight. So, the joystick going right, your nose is initially going right, but your car axis is going left, making the right front wheel go up. Now, if you put the joystick left for a reverse tornado spin, your nose is initially going to go left, but the car axis 
going left is going to make the left front wheel to go down. That was a general idea. Now let's go even more in depth. All right. So in order to go more in depth, we're going to imagine, and I'm going to help with the screen. We're going to imagine that the car is within a ball. Yes. And we're just going to go again with the top part of the joystick and the bottom part of the joystick. So let's look at top side. If we put the joystick top left input only at the beginning, the nose goes down from the top left wheel and touches the very down part of the ball. If we put the joystick top input only at the beginning, the nose goes down from the top left wheel and touches the down right part of the ball. And finally, if we put the joystick top right input only at the beginning, the nose goes down from the top left wheel and touches the right part of the ball. Now, if we constantly use boost while keeping this input, the car is going to go right on the first input, as we saw, making the car go right and then go straight when keeping the joystick input and the boost, because we're doing, per se, a tornado spin, which makes us go straight. If you keep the inputs while boosting, your car is not going to change direction. This is not how you turn. That was it for the top side section. Now, let's go to the down part section of the joystick. It's the symmetrical opposite side, and it goes as follows. If we put the joystick down left input only at the beginning, the nose is going to go up from the top right wheel and touch the left part of the ball. If we put the joystick down input only at the beginning, the nose goes up from the top right wheel and touches the ball at its up left part. Yeah. Now, finally, if we put the joystick down right, input only at the beginning, the nose goes up from the top right wheel and touches the ball at its highest point. And again, if we constantly use boost and we keep the input, the car is going to go left on the first input, as we saw, making the car go left and then straight when keeping the joystick input and boosting for the same exact reason. Notice that at some point, your car is going to be reversed. Another way for me to explain this is that when you tornado spin, the upper right side of your car will want to grab something up with your nose pointing upwards, thus allowing you to take some air. Whereas when you reverse tornado spin, your car will automatically go belly up with your nose pointing slightly downwards. Tornado spin and reverse tornado spin are to air roll what Pichu is to Pikachu, the very basic incomplete form. It's cute too, in a way. Now, if you keep boosting throughout the whole process, notice you will not change direction as we saw. That's a first clue for us to admit that one input does not necessarily mean you're going to turn. Unlike what someone says on YouTube. Tornado spins make you go high and straight according to the direction you were going already. And if you start feathering your boost, you'll notice you can slow down while tornado spinning every time your nose is facing towards you. It's obvious, but I'll just say it anyway. Now, keep all of this in mind. We will come back to it later. But don't learn it by heart. No, just keep in mind what I just said, yeah? Good. All right, it's finally time to get into the the actual theory slash method i am done with talking about those things everything i talked about before reminders of what tornado and reverse tornado spins are i'm gonna actually now start what i call my method which also has its own theory because just like in harry potter one cannot go without the other Introduction. The method will start with three notions which all work together as one beautiful mechanism. Feeling, constants, and tempo and rhythm, which go together. Let's talk about those three pillars, as I call them. We will also at once put those notions into our terminology dictionary, for we will talk about them a lot. What is feeling? Feeling is the ability to get feedback. Oh, but last but how do I do it? I mean, mate, I'm glad you asked. By forcing it through inputs. Inputs give you feedback. 
the more input you give your car until it's capped, because it is capped. It's not capped per se, but it feels like it's capped, so it is capped for us players. The more feedback, and especially constant feedback, is thrown back at you. So the more feeling you get in the end. As Rocket League is a skill game, it answers the same rule any skill game needs. A feedback loop. What's the shorter but not least interesting video from that one guy I was talking about before? Link in the description. So how does a feedback loop work? Well, just think of it this way. If you put many inputs, one after another, on something, whatever you're doing, let's say if you're doing the third input, you will feel as you're doing the third input, you will feel the second input being made. And if you do that consistently, then you're going to get a constant feedback of the latter inputs that you've made all along. That's a feedback loop. What is a constant? A constant is by definition anything that is not a variable. It's something that cannot change whether nature prevents it to change or whether it's thanks to you. A constant is something that allows you to never get lost. It's here if you need it. It's like a compass. The fact that a whole day lasts 24 hours is a constant created by man which relies on nature. The fact that you have friends and family when you're feeling down is also a constant. They are everywhere and here in Rocket League they also exist. On top of that, and that's the beautiful thing, you can create your own. The same way we created days for the nature, giving us 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness, the game also has its own nature which we can sort of manipulate. In a very simple turn, a constant is a pattern. Now, tempo and rhythm. What are tempo and rhythm? Those two words work together with feeling because you use tempo and rhythm as constants. A tempo is a decided fractioning of time into equal pieces. In music, a tempo is, for instance, 120 to the, I don't know how to say that in English, 120 beats per minute, all right? A rhythm is a 4-4 beat. Rhythm is the action doing within the tempo whose speed can change, by the way, except that you try to follow the tempo in a paradoxically intellectualized but felt way. This sounds weird, but the truth is, if you have rhythm in real life, and sorry, if you can't dance, you probably have a bad sense of rhythm, it's very natural. The point is that it's also a feeling. One has a sense of rhythm or not. But here, we're going to make it so, even though you can't dance in real life, you're still gonna have rhythm. And at least you can understand what it is and how to create it, control it, learn it, whatever. You're going to build it. Now, I'm going to finish with those three pillars by saying that feeling is everything. In a skill game, feeling is the basis, the foundation of your skill. But not only that, it's also the most flexible ability you will have. To get good at a skill game, you need to be able to feel, so to learn how to feel and to control how to feel, and you need to do it constantly in order to control what you're doing. It is thus a constant, but one that relies solely on you and not the game. Tempo is basically how long a constant does its full cycle, its full pattern. In other words, tempo is what allows a constant to be validated as a constant in order to be rinsed and repeated. Now, the game already gives us some constants by itself. Let's see what they are. Boost is a constant that you can toggle on and off every time you press the button. If you do and keep it long enough, it'll be considered a constant. When we talk here, we will always talk as though we were always, and I mean always, pressing boost. So that we can put aside the variable that is boost when we don't press it constantly. You will learn that by yourself pretty naturally and I don't believe I should make a chapter on boosting, it would be a waste of time and we are already, holy shit, it's like 40 minutes. Another constant that the game gives us is the revolution or revolutions. And we will right now put it in our terminology dictionary. A revolution is a full rotation of your car on its longitudinal axis while pressing air roll. It defines the time between the moment you press air roll and the moment you get back to the same position you were when you first pressed it. 
It is the one constant the game gives us that cannot change for its speed is fixed. And there is no going faster. It'll always go the same speed and for this only reason it makes it a constant as it follows the same tempo all the time. The tempo is the revolution. The time for the revolution to live and then die. The rhythm is you giving inputs with your controller during one revolution of the car. Get it? Good. I think it's good that you get it. I'm, I'm very happy with that. Why am I talking about feeling, constants and tempo slash rhythm? What do they have in common? Well, as you could hear, they have in common that they all work together. They rely on each other and they give us the opportunity to force the game into giving us feedback and thus feel what we're doing by using some constant that it gives us and constant that we will also create for ourselves. We need to respect a certain tempo and or rhythmic pattern, otherwise the constant will be flawed and thus invalidated and simply won't exist anymore. Let me say that again. We're going to create ourselves some feeling that is relative to our movement through our hands and controller. I kid you not. First and foremost, oh, that's hard to say. First and foremost, first and foremost, first and foremost, fuck. First and foremost, as many YouTubers have said, one must always make inputs at the beginning of a revolution when the hood of your car is facing your way. This is the first constant we will create for ourselves, always working with a nice, clean, neat beginning of a revolution. We will not work with a revolution that has already started. Everything we do is from the first beat of this musical bar or measure, the first beat being when your hood is facing you. Let's put this weird sentence into a very simple, very simple action. For fun, let's do a tornado spin on one revolution and a reverse tornado spin on the next one and so on and so on. Do it. No, no, you do it. What happens? Yep. Even though the first directions the car goes are different, on a one revolution basis, we're going straight. But that's not enough, far from it. No need to be very clever to understand and see on streams and YouTube videos that a directional arrow user doesn't just keep his input at the same spot, but instead he seems to constantly make adjustments within a revolution. Sneaky mother f Many videos talk about how to turn while air rolling. Actually, their whole tutorial video is based on just turning left or right. What they say is not false, but it's just incorrect. It's not all of it. First, one has to take into consideration the fact that the joystick is constantly moving while in the air to do those unteachable micro adjustments everybody's talking about. But secondly, and most importantly, there is more important than just turning. Controlling your car is more important, and I believe before someone learns how to turn, one should already know how to go straight while using the whole joystick. This is the perfect time for us to learn our very first own constant. I mean practical constant. Alright, I am very happy to share with you the very first basic practical concept of this method. The clock. I see many people use it, whether they know they're doing it or not, whether they understand what it is or not. First and foremost, we're going to put it in our terminology dictionary because this one we're going to hear a lot. Directional air roll learning starts now. Have you ever wondered what would happen if you did a full joystick rotation at the same tempo and rhythm with which a revolution of your car goes on a one per one rhythm? Don't forget to start from the far right input on your joystick. Try it, see what happens. Try to get that tempo of the revolution down and try to keep yourself in rhythm with it. Good. Now try to do it while going up in the air and constantly using boost. What's going on here? Mate, yeah, you're going straight, man. Again, let's call this discovery the clock and don't forget to put it in your terminology dictionary. Let's also call the fact of going one direction, even if it's straight, a vector. And let's also put that in the dictionary. Vector means direction, very simple. Now, what happens if you do what we call now a clock 
a double clock, meaning doing two joystick clocks for one car revolution, thus elevating the rhythm twice while staying at the same tempo. Oh my god, you're still going straight. I tried doing a triple clock. Yeah, you might need space for that, but just try doing it. You guessed it. While you were using the clock or the double clock, you could see your car slightly making very subtle turning movements. Listen to me. Those turning movements are the ones we are interested in. And you already kind of know why. Try doing the clock again. Yeah, now you might understand why we're interested in them. Because it is those little movements that give you feedback, thus feeling. Those teeny tiny adjustments of the car, which cancel one another, that's why you're going straight, you can feel them work on your car. What you're feeling is your car's weight and momentum in the air. Remember when I said the inputs are capped in the game? Yeah, try doing more than a triple clock and see what happens. Yeah, man, you're still going straight, but there's a difference. The difference is that the game is not perceiving your joystick as it considers there are too many inputs to be recognized, thus leaving you with absolutely no feedback because it considers that no inputs were made. It's literally as though you had never touched your joystick. By the way, why do they cancel one another? Because if you've done it properly while strictly respecting the tempo, you will have stayed on this input an equal amount of time. Let's say the revolution takes one second to be done. If you're doing the clock properly, each angle of inputs you will have made will have lasted the same amount of time as the other inputs. If we simply say that the time made to do the revolution, which for this example lasts one second, can be divided into four equal parts, then your clock, properly executed, will have its inputs made every quarter of a second precisely. So the car does not find itself going more one way rather than another one, which makes it go straight, as all the inputs perfectly cancel each other and themselves at the right time. Simply put, the clock is a way to redistribute the time spent on your inputs equally within the revolution tempo, as one neat and precise rhythm, allowing you to go straight while still having feedback. Now, I'm pretty sure that this last statement awakens something in you, and you're right about it. It means that this is how you can theoretically start turning. But it's important to understand that in this game, as on a bicycle, one needs to know how to go straight before learning how to turn. Little tip. If, while doing the clock, you start going too much to the left, try two things. One, try starting your clock, not from the far right, but from the upright input on your joystick. We'll see what in a minute. And two, every time your car is upside down, you should be around the left part of your joystick, yeah? If you don't want to go too much to the left, you should linger on this left side a bit more, even though it seems out of rhythm. Again, we'll see why later on. By applying those two tips, you'll see yourself going straighter than before. Remember, the method is here to teach you how to feel. Once you get it, you won't need all of this to go straight or turn because you will, one, have learned from feeling and empiricism what you're doing, and two, you will find, as we'll see later, the limits of this. Once you've learned the method, just like an instrument on which you've spent enough time learning, you'll be able to just improvise or hear flying around freely. A method is merely used to learn and train and then can be discarded when you have enough control. If you forget anything, just come back to the method and your constant and then eventually fly away from it again. I like puns. There's a pun in that. Because I've said what I just said, let me do a pre-note about turning. Turning can be achieved while using the clock by simply keeping an input longer than the other ones. Keep that input in one direction and another vector shall appear. Now lock this input by just finishing your clock and BAM! You've turned left and now you're back to going straight. Let's put locking right next to the clock in our terminology dictionary because locking literally means locking a vector, which means locking a direction. A direction, by the way, that you will have chosen. To keep it simple, when you lock, you choose to go straight from your last vector by using the clock concept. You're right? Good. By the way, when you see on a video the player's joystick going many directions, it's because that person is trying to get the feeling of the car. Not all of these inputs are directions. 
that both use to get the feeling and at the same time give a vector to turn. So one question right now could be, why use a clock instead of a double clock or a triple clock? To be honest, at first I thought this would be arbitrary, but it's not, because physics. First, the faster your car moves, the more strongly it responds, which also means that the feeling is also stronger. That's an engineering thing that I was told and hopefully I'm not wrong saying it. On top of that, a slower rhythm also means a higher chance of being out of rhythm, thus making the car not go straight. The reason being you might spend way more time on an input rather than on another one because you're focused, and because of that you might find that using the double clock is somehow easier. The theory stays the absolute same. You pick and choose what you want in it. I use the double clock more than the clock, but again, it's just a personal feeling. Don't get lost though, as all the inputs you're making will have to be cancelled quickly, and if you don't, bam, you've missed the revolution tempo and you're lost until you get the feeling back, usually by waiting for the hood of your car to face you and start your constant again. But again, according to physics, the faster your car moves, so the more inputs you give, the stronger the feeling is. In the end, again, I personally use the double clock more than the simple clock, but in training, when you're learning, you should use both, especially the simple clock, as it is more basic, hence more important to master. The better you are at mastering the basics, the better off you will be. I'm not making this up, I'm not the first one to say it on the planet, that's how it is. Lastly, I only use the triple clock while doing rings map because I have a lot of space and it allows me to take very nice turns while keeping my nose towards where I want to go. To be honest, I realized I was doing a triple clock while making this video. Before that, I thought the inputs were capped at the double clock, but I was wrong, you can go for triple. Not really useful unless you're trying to speedrun something, as it actually requires you to be extremely precise with your joystick. It's literally harder than doing a clock or a double clock. And on top of that, you would have to know how to turn with a clock first, and then go for a double clock turn, and then go for a triple clock turn. It's not that hard, but it's also not that useful. All right, now that you know about clocks, and that we've seen what tornadoes are again, let's take a step back and correct something that seemed simpler to say before, but is now incorrect. Let's talk about angular momentum. Imagine you and your friend are on a merry-go-round, and you are more towards the center of the merry-go-round, and he is more at the outside portion, yeah? If the merry-go-round starts turning, you're both gonna stay at the same spot, yeah? That means that he's actually going faster than you because he has to catch up. Now we can relate to this with a car. If the car was not a square, but a circle, the center of mass of your car is the center of the circle, yeah? The diagonals are the outside portions of the merry-go-round. So every time you do a diagonal flip, in a weird way, your diagonals are gonna go faster than your straight angles. This is a very simple analogy of what angular momentum is, and hopefully I'm not wrong. As I said, when doing a clock, you get a feeling. The feeling I'm talking about while using the clock, if we want to go more in depth, is most felt at the very end of your clock, when your joystick is going top right, and even more felt when doing a double clock, because from what I was told and what I said above, the faster the movement, the stronger the angular momentum, meaning for us using this method, the stronger the feeling. I'm excluding triple clock here. This is the moment when you can actually feel your car the most per se. It considers the diagonals to have more momentum of movement than all of the straight sides, meaning up, down, left, and right. This is why doing a diagonal flick is better than a front or a side flick. It'll have more power, the same way the crawl swim has more power than the breaststroke swim. Now, as we're using the clock, we're going the tornado spin way, which means the diagonals we're most interested in are the right diagonals because tornado spinning, which makes you get height, is having your joystick to the right. 
For this reason, it's also where you can get the most of the feeling. At the end of your clock or double clock, focus on what feedback you're getting and get used to it again. Love it like it's your baby. By the way, this is why I said when I taught you at the clock that if you mess up your rhythm, you'll start going to the left and that maybe you could start your clock if you want it from upright. Yeah, the first reason being what I just described, the fact that your car will have a small burst of momentum, allowing you to go a bit farther in front of you and less to the left. And the second reason being that obviously, putting your joystick up and to the right will make your car go less to the left, as this very input is the main one used to go to the right. Because tornado spin means your joystick does not answer the logical joystick up means I'm going down and joystick down means I'm going up and joystick left means I'm going left and joystick right means I'm going right. As we said before getting into the actual method. Long story short, the clock is best usable to go straight by starting it at the up into the right input. It was easier for me to get to this point by saying it was from the right as it follows the tornado spin inputs. Nevertheless, you can get a clock from the right side input, which is what I do. All that matters is that you put enough inputs at the right time and within the tempo for you to be able to force the game into creating this feedback. In the end, it all depends on your ability to be precise, but what you should seek is that weird momentum feeling. Now that we know about going straight, now that we've touched a bit about feedback through input resulting in feeling and thus control over our car, let's go back to turning. Except we'll go a little bit farther than we did with the out of rhythm concept for turning. The basics of turning while also using feedback loops such as the clock. Upright, down right. That's what every single YouTuber has told us. It's not incorrect, but it's not enough. Because when air rolling, you shouldn't, and actually you don't, keep your joystick in one input for the whole duration of the revolution. Why? Because we're not in a rings map and have to readjust our trajectory very quickly all the time. What they should have said is the following. The first input on which a vector can be locked to turn left is down right. The first input on which a vector can be locked to turn right is upright. Example, if I want to go left, I'm going to jump, boost, and at the same time press air roll plus my joystick down right until the vector is ready, and then I'm going to lock it and clock it. That's right, that's it. There's no more to turning. There's no more to turning. Now you can turn. That's all you need to know. Just remember what we said before when we we're talking about all the different inputs possible at the beginning of the method. Upright and downright, those two inputs are sufficient to know how to turn. Just also remember what I said, that there's a top part of your joystick that makes you go right, and there's a bottom part of your joystick that makes you go left. That's all you need to do, that's right. And it's important to know that if you miss your clock for any reason after locking and clocking it, in this case, you've given a lot of time in turning, so your clock should be late, try to finish it by catching the clock. You'll be fast enough to still get feedback, but not fast enough so that the game doesn't register your input. Let me say that again. If your joystick did not follow the car revolution fast enough while doing the clock, whether it's because you missed it, which happens because you simply missed it, or because the ball cam messed up your perception of where you're at, or because you needed to spend more time of the revolution activating, per se, a vector in order to turn, like the example I just gave of going left, Catch your clock. If it's really not possible, either wait for it on the next revolution with your joystick going straight to the right like a tornado spin, or just drop your joystick and wait for your next revolution because that's all that matters. And we'll call this refreshing the car. Another way of refreshing your car that I didn't mention is to obviously let go of air roll button and try to put your car with your nose facing upwards, revolution neutral. This is how you never get lost, by the way, by constantly, even if you mess up, respecting the tempo. It's better to be off rhythm than off tempo. Good? Good. Now let's, by the way, put catching the clock and refreshing the car in our terminology. To catch the clock is the action of speeding up or slowing down your joystick inputs while doing the clock so that you end up the end of your clock at the same time your revolution ends, thus keeping your bad off rhythm beat into a new tempo measure or tempo bar 
hopefully allowing you to keep a good rhythm on the next revolution. If you're too early and you want to catch your clock, just slow down your rhythm while doing the clock. And if you're too late, finish the clock, so catch the clock faster in order to get your joystick to the right at the beginning of the next revolution. If you don't want to catch your clock because you're way too late or way too early or because what you've been doing is very, very nasty and you can't get around it, refresh your car. Meaning either keep your joystick as close to the right as you can to wait for the revolution to end and start again, or just plain drop your joystick and wait for the revolution to end its cycle. A third way of refreshing your car is to completely let go of your air roll button and trying to make your nose face upwards. Notice two things. If you drop your joystick, you will instantly lose feedback because you're not giving inputs. On the other hand, if you put your joystick to the right, as I said, it's good, you're ready for the next revolution, but while you're putting your joystick to the right, you're giving a flying input. If you're too early, meaning the car is upside down and you put your joystick to the right, you will go down to the ground. In any case, it's better to keep in rhythm. Again, keeping your constant straight, even if you mess up, that's how we build consistency. At the same time of still working with building our sense of feeling in the sense that recognizing what it feels like to mess up is also training your feeling. Instead of only relying on empiricism to learn, we're actually helping empiricism learn through us. This would also be the right moment to repeat that as we saw in the car movement, up, right and down, right, all the only ways to go left and right is just that if you start your turns, especially while learning, by using the side of the joystick relative to the tornado spin, your car will go upwards instead of downwards. It's a very silly fact, but personally, if I'm in a plane, I'd rather lose control while going higher in the air rather than losing control while dive bombing straight to the ground as the left part of the joystick, which is relative to the reverse tornado spin, does. Again, not any YouTuber gives you the exact reason on why use the right part of the joystick in order to turn. Well, now you know. So again, if you want to turn left, let's say, accelerate, jump and boost, and press air roll while at the same time putting your joystick down right. When you're going as far left as you want to go, which essentially could also be defined as make a tornado until your nose is facing the way you want to go, catch the clock and go straight. Yes, you could turn left without putting your joystick down right. All that matters is where your nose is pointing and when you're going to boost. And we've seen that during a tornado spin, your nose literally makes kind of a vertical circle around the axis of your car, if your car is facing straight up, obviously. So essentially, you could just make a tornado spin and go straight and at some point catch the clock and be going left. All that changes is that we've also seen that putting your joystick down and to the right as a first input makes your car go left to start with because it doesn't cut your car right in the middle like a tornado does. You will turn less by using a tornado and catching the clock. The best way is still to give the correct input to your car the one input you need to position your car the best way for it to go somewhere specific. But again, there aren't many. Left is down right, right is top right. Now add to that your boost and you're done. Again, all along remember we've been seeing directional air roll training with boost constantly up. This is because we're trying to learn how to make ourselves feel the car. When you get it, you'll just know when to stop listening and you'll know what to pick and choose from the information I'm giving. Even though I'm not going to make a chapter on boosting, you can see for yourself that releasing boost when you're facing a direction you don't want to go to, and then applying boost when your nose is going the direction you want to go, is how you'll eventually be turning, for real, where you want to go. We're here analyzing what happens when you make a boost constant, as it would be overcomplicating things to make the boost a variable. In a nutshell, Choose your direction, give the first joystick input, basically upright or downright. Lock it, clock it, catch the clock or refresh it, rinse and repeat. Again, this is the basics of how to turn while also using feedback loops. Remember, the only thing we're doing here is give one directional input at the beginning of the revolution and then 
give a feedback loop because in reality when you're good at air rolling what you're going to do is that you're going to give directional inputs at the beginning of the revolution and then give some feedback inputs and you're going to rinse and repeat that all the time at each revolution now that we know about the clocks concept and turning let's see the limits of those the clock, as you could tell with a little training, has its limits, as we can only move our joystick in one specific manner. We use all of the joystick, but it just moves one specific fashion. You'll notice that sometimes your car will start pointing to the left and no amount of clock or turning or putting your joystick upright and waiting for the vector to appear and then locking it can stop this effect, especially if you're going full boost and doing clocks and double clocks. It's time to learn about what we will now call an insert in our terminology dictionary, calibrating. Calibrating is the first time we're going to neglect what we said earlier about when to work with our constants and this time make an adjustment in between our revolution. It is the only time we will need to do it. Why do we need to calibrate if we can simply do it when the revolution starts? Well, because as you'll feel, sometimes waiting for a revolution is too late because your car's nose and or your vector will be already going too far towards the left, making it too difficult and too long to either get your nose back towards the right and or quickly change whatever vector you had. That is why we need to find a way to get this change in between your revolution so that when the new one starts, you're quite literally back on track. I like puns, man, today. What the? You already know what calibrating is and you've already used it unconsciously. Do you remember the two tips I gave if you didn't go straight while making a clock? The first tip was to start upright instead of far right, and we saw that this was because of angular momentum. And the second tip was linger on the left side of your joystick. Now, let's go back to reverse tornado spin. When you do a reverse tornado spin, your car will go belly up, and that is what we're interested in. Simply put, if your nose goes to the left too much and your car goes belly up, everything is symmetrically opposite meaning that when you're belly up, your nose will now be facing more towards the right of your screen than it was just before. What we do with calibrating is stressing this phenomenon by giving it a left input, making the nose of your car as your belly up go towards the right of your screen even more. Now, do you put your joystick to the far left, up left or down left when the car is upside down? Listen, again, your car is upside down. So if I put a down input with my joystick and my car is upside down, my nose is going to go towards the ground. On the contrary, if I put my joystick up when my car is going belly up, well, my nose is going to go towards the sky. So that depends on what you want to do. If you want to get some air, you're going to want to go top left. If you want to go down, you're going to want to go down left. If you go straight to the left, not much is going to change vertically. At first, I thought when I discovered that thing and I put a word on it, I thought that the calibrating should be done when the car is upside down. But the actual truth on when to make the input is right before your car is totally upside down. This very small nuance is similar to the fact that I say that the clock should start in tornado spin, meaning far right, and I say that so that you understand quickly what I mean. And in reality, then I say it should be done with the input up and to the right. So if you want to calibrate actually more, do make the input before your car is upside down, right before, while still not doing it at the beginning of the revolution, as this might just mess you up, given that it will put you in a reverse tornado spin with your nose going downwards, and then you'll just panic and you're just going to crash. So let's take calibrating in a nutshell. We've seen that the joystick has eight inputs. Among those eight inputs, six of them are directional inputs. So all of the inputs, except from far left and far right, which are relative to tornado spin and reverse tornado spin. But calibrating is composed of three inputs, far left, up left, and down left. All those three inputs are also relative to the reverse tornado spin. The moment to calibrate, the right moment to calibrate, is right before your revolution gets to its middle, its half. Let's say about 25 degree rotation in. When you get to a 25 degree rotation, you can 
start calibrating and you will notice that your nose is going to start facing towards the right. It's going to take a new vector towards the right. So this is calibrating. I use it all the time. Everybody uses it all the time. You're going to calibrate all the time. I use it all the all time. The time. All right, now that we know about calibrating, we can turn right two ways. First, by putting your input up into the right at the beginning of the revolution, and also by calibrating. So what you can do is actually start turning towards the right even more by doing first the input upright, and then instantly calibrating by swiping your joystick towards the left at the right time. But we're going to go even further than this. The reverse clock. Beware, this is not what it seems. A reverse clock can make you take a very tight turn. Try starting flying and doing a simple reverse clock while starting from the top part of the joystick, wherever you want as long as it's from the top part of the joystick. By reverse clock, I do mean a normal clock rhythm like you know how to. I don't mean a double. So do it. That's right, it's a hard turn right. No matter where you start it, top left or top or top right, you will turn right. Now try doing the same thing while starting from the bottom part of the joystick. Yep, now you're making a hard left. We will call this a reverse clock and put it in our terminology dictionary. Again, I'm being very specific with the term reverse clock as a simple clock. All right, now you can notice two things. If you keep doing a reverse clock, you will obviously make your car go behind you. We can hence say and see that it's a nice way of making a U-turn in the air. For example, if you start an aerial but you see that you're not going to miss the ball and it's too late for you to get to the ground and do a half flip, then you can make this sort of hard turn, hard flip U-turn in the air. Second thing to notice, the far left and far right inputs still do count as their own directions, unlike the tornado spin and reverse tornado spin, which don't make you go left or right for, as we saw way back, no wheels are locked. With a reverse clock, if you start it from far left, you will still make a hard left turn as though it was part of the bottom part of the joystick. And if you start it from the far right, your car will respond as though it was from the top part of the joystick, meaning you'll go right. So the far right is including in the top part of the joystick and the far left is included in the bottom part. Good? Good. That's reverse clock. Be very precise with it. I mean a simple rhythm clock. One per one rhythm. Just like a simple clock, but the other way around. Counterclockwise. All right? Good. We're going to go even further with a reverse clock. The advanced way of turning is to give more than one directional input to your car, meaning not only giving one input when the revolution is neutral, as we've seen before in the Basics of Turning chapter, where we took one directional input while the revolution was neutral and then did a feedback loop. Now we're going to see a more advanced way of turning while using directional inputs continuously during the revolution. And we've already kind of seen it. Now what you want to do is divide your reverse clock into two parts. The first part being down, right, up, and the second part being up, left, down. All right? Now there are going to be two speeds for each of these half reverse clocks. There's going to be a slower speed and there's going to be a faster speed. The slower speed is the one that's going to make you turn and actually turn more than just using one input. Actually, the first speed is going to enable the car to turn even more than it would usually. So if you do down right up, slowly, very slowly, your car is going to go left. If you do up, left, down, slowly, your car is going to go right. So that's the slow speed of the half reverse clocks. All right, this is turning 2.0, if you'd prefer. Now, the faster speed is going to regulate the verticality of your car. So just try doing down right up, but much faster than you did just before and see what happens. Yeah, your car is going to get vertical. 
Now, if you do the opposite, if you put your car vertically and then do up, left, down, fast, what's going to happen? Your car is going to get horizontal again. So you can change and moderate the verticality of your car while using the exact same thing you would if you wanted to turn in a more advanced way. All right, so that's turning 2.0. Now, all you have to do is add some feedback loops to that. And this is how you actually fly. Good? Great. So what you want to do, basically, is to start at any directional input and make half a reverse clock from that point. And that should make you turn. If you do it slowly enough, obviously. Now that we know how to do all that, how do you feel? Master the clocks and you will master calibrating. Add to that the reverse clock and you can make U-turns. Do half reverse clocks and you know how to turn the advanced way. Master all of these, and I'm saying master, but master is a big word. Just get a nice foundation of feeling for these notions. And we are at the end of the method. What? Whoa, whoa, wait, whoa, 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 I'm confused. Why the? Mm. That's it? Well, yeah, mate, that's it. Because by now, you might have figured out that the clock or the double clock is just a certain type of combos, as we may call them. The simple fact that you can mess up your clock by starting it on a different input but still get a feeling is here to show you that you have learned muscle memory. If you're good at the clock slash double clock, you'll also know when you're not in the right tempo for it while you're doing a clock rhythm pattern constant. You'll still go straight but the feeling will be different. That's super interesting to notice and notice you will as soon as you recognize what the clock feels like and you can pretty much Master it again. Master is a big word, but it's after all not that hard to do to roll the joystick with rhythm starting from one specific spot and then make a clockwise motion with it. That's why we can also say that the clock and the double clocks are obviously not the only constants of pattern or in other words combos. This is the end of the method. Thank you for watching. Thank you, thank you, thank you, oh my god, thank you so much, thank you, <laughs> this is crazy, thank you so much, thank you, thank you, <laughs> I can't believe this, this is crazy, thank you, there's so many of you, look at you up there, look at you up there on the sides and everything, you guys are crazy, you guys are fucking insane, thank you so much, I hope you liked it, I really hope you liked it, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Oh my god, I don't have the words for this. You guys want a joke? Okay, I created a new word. It's plagiarism. So don't fuck with me or I'll strike you. <laughs> it's a good one. <sighs> what you say? You want to see more combos? All right, man, I'm going to give you more. All right, uh, the reverse double clock. Just try for the sake of it to do what we will call now a reverse double clock. And yes, I said this time reversed double clock, not reverse clock, because you know what that does. And let's put it in the dictionary. The joystick input shouldn't start from the far right of your joystick this time, but from the bottom. So do a reverse double clock, double rhythm of the clock, counterclockwise. What happens when you do that? Yeah, your car still goes straight, but it feels different, doesn't it? It feels like it's being pulled from your forward wheels rather than pushed from your back wheels. In other words, reverse double clock feels like you're dealing with a front wheel car, whereas a clock or a double clock or triple clock feels like you're using a back wheel car. Obviously, this isn't true. But I say it so that you understand you must recognize a certain feeling, a feeling that is different from the clock. Notice that the reverse double clock can make you go up as easily as just pressing down on your joystick without air rolling. Why? Because as we've seen in the reverse clock chapter, if you get the second speed of the reverse clock, the fastest one of the both, you will regulate the verticality of your nose. So you can just do that and then reverse double clock and go straight. It feels like gravity has a lesser impact when you're using the reverse double clock.
Also, notice that if you don't do a reverse double clock quickly enough, you will not go straight because it will actually be, what we said before, a simple reverse clock. A simple reverse clock doesn't work like a normal clock because your car is not counterbalancing the aerial rotations anymore. But you're rather more going with it as you're turning in a left circle motion, a counterclockwise motion on top of the left air roll, which literally makes it accelerate and go crazy. In order to get that constant to be equalized, what do we do? We double the rhythm in the tempo. Let's see it as a sort of double negative. If clock goes left, which is the air roll, plus right, which is the joystick input, then car goes straight. Then a reverse double clock would go left plus left equals straight. It's unlogical and it's perfect like that. This needed to be said in order to show that a reverse clock and a reverse double clock, although it might be confusing to explain and understand, are clearly not the same thing and the difference holds on a very subtle little nuance. Slower joystick means you're going to turn, faster joystick means you're going to regulate the verticality and even faster will make you go straight. Good. Good. Rame, you got me. I tricked you because I said it was another combo, and it is, but it had to be said also because of the differences with the simple reverse clock. Now, there actually are other combos. Now, just try to go up and down while following the constant of tempo. What happens? You go straight, and then do the same thing with left and right. What happens? Yeah, man, you're still going straight. It's the same absolute thing. If you try now with upright, downright, yeah, man, you're still going straight, no matter what you do, if you manage to cancel it by either doing the complete opposite input, or not the actual input, the input that will make your car go the opposite direction from the last input, your car will go straight. You have all you need to go on your own now, because from now on, your muscle memory is going to take over, especially now that hopefully you've understood how it works. Just see for yourself, now that you can feel, and now that you've practiced more of it to the point of controlling it, what you feel when you do all those different combos. So the clock, double clock, reverse double clock, up, down, left, right, diagonal, up, right, and diagonal, down, right, so up, right, down, right. They all have their little special traits, but they're all the same. And now, finally now, we can start relying on empiricism time doing its work with our muscle memory because now we know what we're doing so let me just talk about the those other combos a little bit more yeah so the up down combo the feeling is as though you can keep a straight ball better on your nose why well simply because you're not giving any hard directions sideways to your car if you do it fast enough so the up and down inputs will feel like they're actually registered as up and down better I know I said that while using air roll, the inputs don't answer in a classic way, like up means down, but it still feels the same when you go up down fast enough for the game to register them as nose pointing down to the ground and nose pointing up to the sky. Now, the left-right combo. I use it often. Once you understand the constants and the tempo slash rhythm part of all of this, you will notice that you can basically go anywhere while just using those two inputs. As I said about the up-down combo, the game here still registers your car as going left or right in a quite normal fashion rather than up and down. So if you want to turn with this combo, as we said, it's all about feeling when to keep the input and when to switch to the other one. It's literally a chain of getting a vector, locking it now not with the clock, but with this combo. So you choose a vector, you lock it by doing left, right, which makes you go straight, and then you just rinse and repeat, and you keep on turning and going straight and whenever you want. Now, the diagonals, I've talked about them already. They have to do with the angular momentum. I saw many, many streamers go straight with only those inputs and that's one of the things that made me realize that it's just about rhythm and tempo um i saw this guy go top right down right top right down right top right down right top, and he was just going straight but he was going fast all right so that was it for the combos now notice that these combos work in asymmetry if you don't make a combo with a symmetry you won't go straight that's why the clock is so important, because it shows you that with the whole joystick, you can go straight, meaning it helps you to use those other combos, which I just gave here.
The moment you stop respecting tempo and rhythm, while also not using symmetrically opposite inputs, it's the moment that your car is going to stop going straight and you might lose your clean, constant feedback. But then again, just wait for the next revolution, mate. Now, I personally don't use the diagonals combo often. I would say less than 5% of the time, um, as I just don't like the feeling I get. But you will see me use clocks, double clocks, uh, left, right, a lot, especially in uh, rings map. Um, and sometimes when I actually feel like I need the vertically straight nose, the up-down combo. I'm talking about air dribbles during which I get maybe too much speed when I get under the ball, and I almost get beyond it. But then, when you hear me talk about combos, don't stick with that idea, yeah? It's not about the combos. I'm here to analyze with you what the combos do, their, their little specific traits, again, their subtle nuances, but it's not about combos. It's not about that. It's about tempo, rhythm, constant, and getting feeling out of all of this. And you could get feeling by doing something that is not a constant, but your feeling would be bad. <laughs> that's the only reason I talk about all those things but don't get your head just uh, twisted with all the combos because this is not uh, uh, this is not Street Fighter yeah this is Rocket League what I mean is just don't put too much importance on me when I say when I talk about even the word combo yeah all right don't be blinded that's what I mean because a combo is nothing more than a feedback loop so you have many feedback loops, not just the clocks. You have all of those combos. Oh, by the way, we can now change the definition, finally, of locking. As we now have more constants or combos to make us go straight and get feedback, we can now say that locking is the action of using a combo or using a constant that will make you go straight right after having chosen a vector or direction instead of just having to do it with clocks. So you want to go right, jump, boost, and then press air ball while putting your joystick up and to the right. When the vector has appeared and you've chosen how tight you want it, use any combo, clock, reverse, double clock, up, down, left, right, right, angles, go, la, 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 and go straight. Because remember, the combos are nothing more than feedback loops. All right, I'm going to summarize everything I've said in a big ass nutshell in about 30 seconds time. But before that, I'm going to give a floating tip. The more inputs, the less the car makes big adjustments, the more it goes straight and the more speed you get, because your car is straight compared to like a tornado, which makes you lose speed, obviously. Now the second floating tip. The moment you spend too much time on an input is the moment your car starts changing its main vector. That'll be the last time I say that. Kind of makes me feel, I don't know, nostalgic or something. Yeah. Now let's summarize everything. All right, let's summarize a big ass in a nutshell of all we have learned. It's going to be very quick. Um, here we go. Three pillars, feeling, constant, tempo slash rhythm. Then we have the clock or the double clock or the triple clock. And after the clocks, we have locking and clocking, which is done by catching the clock. And after that, we have refreshing the car. After that, we have turning while using feedback loops. Then after turning, we have calibrating, which allows us to turn the nose of our car slightly in between a revolution so that we can change direction easily while not making a U-turn. Then after calibrating, which is a thing in itself, but also an introduction to the next chapter, we have the reverse clock, which is how to U-turn or make very hard turns left and right but again if you use half a reverse clock that's the actual way of turning and you have two speed a slower one that makes you turn and a faster one that gives you verticality then we have other combos which work the same way as the clock concept so we have the reverse double clock the up down and the left right and then finally we have the diagonals the method could be shortened to this just remember to learn when to let go of boost by yourself. But you know what? I am a man full of surprises and I will not leave you there hanging. So you and I, we're going to stick together just a little bit more and we're going to see a bit about boosting and other stuff in the next section. I'll see you right there.
I believe that what is often missing in a method are the actual opinions and thoughts of the person who made it. In theatre, we have theory, then practical method, but I've always believed that after those two things, a third part should always be present. Thoughts. This is hence going to be a mix of tips, remarks, how I train tips, why, when and how I did this method, as well as other thoughts. Number one. People say directional air roll is one of the slowest mechanics to learn in this game. I believe that hence it should be the one to learn the fastest. And I do believe it can. So air roll, more than a mechanics, is a flying technique. And you can apply it to other games like GTA or Battlefield or any actual game with planes that allows you to air roll. Now the only difference is going to be the sensitivity of the flying in those games. This technique is a technique because it gives you car control. It's not just a mechanics. It's a way to control your car in the air. Hence the fact that it unlocks your mechanical potential as a player. Number two, when learning the clock in practical training like rings or redirects, press boost for one revolution. This is very important. If you don't make any joystick inputs, do not press boost. Be very careful and very consistent with that, otherwise it might mess your brain up. Not pressing boost or fluttering boost or not pressing boost for one revolution while you're trying to work on a constant such as the clock will break your muscle memory which is essentially here to recognize muscle patterns, and we're trying to create them. So, one clock, one constant boost. Unlike what that coach says on YouTube, and I'm making quotation marks with my fingers right now, do not stop pressing boost when you're implementing a muscle memory constant. All right, I still can't believe he said, don't press boost all the time, but please do. All right? Number three. Play in Lethemir's ring map for the clock, and I would recommend what you've seen me do here, Neon Height Rings map, as it's maybe the easiest. Number four. At the same time of doing rings, I played some custom trainings regarding aerials, only using clocks and double clocks with locking vectors. Basically, after seeing that the ball would go up left at a certain speed, I knew I needed to do one clock with full boost and then down right into locking a clock to get to the ball. At that point, I discovered the notion of calibrating because I saw I was missing something. Number five. When you're done with a simple clock or double clock, you may want to start feathering your boost. All right? This will increase your learning abilities for you will start to work on a different variable while using a solid constant basis that you have built. At the same time, and that's the magic of it, you'll also reinforce what you've learned to feel about the clock. Because you are one beautiful mother purist. Number six. Now keep in mind that when your vector isn't towards the center of your screen, your perception of the revolution will be different. Your car might be ready for the next revolution, but you heard one be in front of you. This happens a lot, whether you're using ball cam or not. Every time the direction where you want to go isn't facing towards you, it'll change. The more X-centered your aim, the more changes in perception you get. If the ball goes over you, your brain is going to wrinkle. That's a good moment to decide to refresh your revolution, like the 20th level of Lethmere's Rings. But your revolution will keep going as normal. Don't you forget that. So you should refresh it when you think or believe or feel that it will be easy for you to find a revolution to work within the next second. You don't have to refresh anything, by the way. If you keep your feeling right, I mean correct, all right? If you keep your feeling correctly, you might not even need to refresh it. But the perception is, and that is a fact, is going to mess you up. It's like someone preventing you to do something. That's what perceptions do uh, in this game. Number seven, when I got the clock concept, uh, I had not tried nor discovered double clocks yet. I first tried it in rings and after a few days, the 24th of July, 2021, I finally finished Lethemir's Neon Heart Rings in, and get this, 43 minutes, 49 seconds after 83 deaths. I was happy and then I was unhappy. 
After that, I went to Freeplay, and after that, I went to Redirex. This, as I said, is when I discovered the concept of calibrating. I had done it without knowing what it was in rings, but I had been conscious of the feeling while doing it, so I started experimenting. I put my car upside down on the ground, pressed left and went, damn it, I'm so freaking stupid, it was in front of me the whole time. The next days, I had it. I went back to rings after becoming better at clocks and calibrating when I suddenly felt the need to try wall to air dribble slash air drags. I'm not shitting you when I say I instantly or almost instantly got it. Like I don't stream per se, but I stream to my friends. And the first clip of my channel was me yelling at my friend, clip it, please clip this, clip it, okay? The only difficulty was to understand that I needed on both walls to start with a tornado spin, the joystick to the right, and then starting my clock as soon as the hood of my car was aligned with the ball. Keep in mind, the right wall feels more difficult than the left one when using left air roll and vice versa. It's just a feeling. Because we're here to learn well and hard, we are what we call purists. We will prefer working on the right wall. If it's harder, when we get it, we'll even be better at it. So the only moment you go to the left wall is when the game spawns you to the right wall. All right? That's the only moment you can allow yourself that guilty pleasure of trying an air dribble or air drag on the easiest wall. Good? Good. Number eight. So now you know a bit more about how to get a reset. Getting a reset is pretty easy. All you have to do is get to the wall and jump and at the very last revolution before your car hits the ball you're going to want to make a quarter of a reverse clock starting from the reverse tornado spin so if you're left air rolling you want to put your joystick to the left and then down if you're right air rolling you want to put your joystick to the right and then down and that should put you in a good position to get a reset easy peasy Number nine, the better you are at clocks, the better you are at every other combo. Take the clock as the foundations or field building. Now that you're pretty decent at it, now that you've trained your rhythms within the tempo, the other combos just feel like kind of natural. I'm pretty sure you'll feel more comfortable with a double clock like I do, but again, we don't want to be decent at this, we want to be actually good, so even if you're to drop the clock for the double clock, still work up your feeling of what the clock is and does. It is paramount. Of course, do the same with a double clock, but don't forget the symbol clock. I would advise doing reverse double clocks after the clock, and then the rest of the combos. Reverse double clock might mess up your brain the first time you try to train it because the feeling is not as big as you're not fighting the air roll direction which is left with your car going right but instead you're almost enabling it but I can guarantee you it'll take you no time until you think okay I just I understand the point because by then you'll have understood the feeling of rhythm you need and you will have again a basis of what feeling is. So if you get another feeling, well, you can still recognize this as a new feeling. So as a feeling, okay, that's what you need to be good at. Good? Good. So very soon after that, doing the reverse double clocks, you'll start using less clocks and more of the all-around combos as you will have understood, one, some specific angles and inputs by empiricism, and two, that the tempo rhythm is actually all there needs to be applied. And I am repeating myself, and I will keep doing so until the end of the video because I want this to be clear. Just remember, as soon as you stop giving inputs, you will lose your feedback. The better we get at this, the less we need feedback for we will know some things by heart. So, through the use of a method, we've been able to help empiricism instead of letting it do all the work. But remember, when you're lost, when you're in doubt, go back to the constants. Do some clock-like patterns, hood facing you, and you should be good to go. Alright, number 10. A little note on feeling. We can make a little, a little scheme of how that goes. So, no feeling nor feedback gets to input made in a consistent manner, gets to feedback, gets to feeling. So, see this as an engine. If you actively keep it rolling, you will keep feeling it and it will allow you to feel it. 
So it's like a, a virtuous cycle. It's like a paradox, all right? If you keep using it, you'll keep feeling, and this will help you keep feeling, all right? So thus controlling it, thus actively making it go and go and go. It's, again, a virtuous cycle until you decide to stop or you fuck it up, which is not you wanting it to happen, but it happening. Whenever you stop, you stop getting feedback and thus feeling and thus control. Unless you've spent enough time working on your feeling and now, finally, thanks to empiricism, you know what to do next. But here, as we are learning, this is not going to be here. This might be here in like a month. Number 11. 10, 11. Number 11. Rolling the R's. I first started thinking about making a tutorial at the same moment there was a controversy about Rocket League dying in the summer of 2021. At that moment, I was eating, drinking, and sponging up every YouTube and stream tutorial I could find about directional air roll. I knew that when I could do it, my whole gameplay would change. All I could hear from people for a few weeks was the state of Rocket League and, and famous content creators saying what the game need is, but none of them talked about the fact that people might just stop playing it because they didn't succeed doing all the cool stuff other people did, and yes, I was feeling frustrated about being part of them. I wanted to learn it badly, and I should stress that more. I wanted to learn it badly, and I was dead curious. Now there's an adage that goes, whom seeks will find. That was my motto for Rocket League. Every day I knew I would not be as good as the day after, and that kept me going. Do not focus on what you can't do right now. Focus on the fact you're actually, right now, at this very moment, right now is you're fucking things up, and you feel desperate. You're already working on being better for tomorrow. Look for it as though it was a Christmas present you're waiting for. You know you're gonna get it, so I kid you not, if you tell yourself tomorrow I will get that specific thing that I just messed up right there because you accept that it doesn't have to do with your will or your present skills but that what you're doing now will be sponged up by your brain and forged into what we call muscle memory. You will learn this faster than I expect you to. But if you want to learn, you're going to have to use dedication and that's discipline. And for that, I can't really do anything for you. So hopefully I'm clear when I say that if you don't really want to do it and you don't want to, you don't want to give in the time, you're not going to do it. <laughs> it's like playing Yasuo on League of Legends. If you play for like two weeks thinking, I want to be a good Yasuo player. And the very first time you feel so depressed by playing it that you stop, then you're never going to play it again. What you should have done is, at that very moment where it was the hardest for you to keep playing Yasuo, you actually kept playing Yasuo. Uh, that'll be the last League of Legends thing I say because I hate the game. Um, so, again, still in number 11, nothing that you train in here is a waste of time, all right? Nor is it speculation. We're not speculating. You are currently training. So try, somehow, to put your ego aside because you're failing. And yes, that is your ego talking. Not you, that's your ego. That's stupidity. That's laziness, all right? Try to put it aside and realize that this is how one learns. I believe in the work smart, not hard motto, but I also believe that nothing has ever been done without hard work. Thing is, hard work can be passionate work. Like lazy people and gurus will try to make you forget that by saying you're working too hard. These people, don't want you to succeed because they don't want you to achieve their level. Work hard, be a purist, be curious, understand for yourself and never, ever take things for granted, especially if someone tells you that what you're doing is pointless. In two months, this guy will still think he's good because the game has put him in a C2 rank and he still can't fly but he doesn't give a shit because his elo is enough, while you can casually frip preset on his ass. All right? People who say freestyle is useless are people who don't understand the game for what it truly is. They take the game as it's given to them. There's no GC3 that can't flip reset on you. There's no GC3 that can't casually do a ceiling musty. No, they, they can all do it. All of them. That's the correlation. The correlation is that mechanics are the essence of Rocket League. All right, enough of that. Number 12. There's nothing more annoying to me than hearing people talk about the setup. 
the setup is nothing important compared to actually controlling your car in the air. You can get all the worst setups in the game. If you know what you're doing while flying, you're still going to do something and feel good doing so, even if the move itself is bad. So, yes, there are great setups and you can use them to your advantage because it's going to be easier. But setups are nothing. So every time you see a video talk about um, the setup or you need to bind some buttons I mean, if you haven't figured that out by yourself before, unless this video is the first you've ever seen about it, uh, just quit the video. You're not going to learn anything. That person is not going to tell you anything important, right? Right, so one of the perks, as I said, of directional air roll is that when you know how to do it and you're trying some other mechanics in free play, if you miss that said mechanic or if you get frustrated, every aerial moment can be a satisfying one by just starting dribbling the ball in the air. You will feel good about yourself just because you still managed to do it. Again, don't take that for granted. That's the best thing. All right, number 13. I talked about it before, but I'm going to talk more about it now. People who say don't work hard, work smart are people who don't want you to succeed. Indeed, do work hard, but with a plan. Work hard methodically. That's how you get better. Don't be stupid thinking you can work smart. I did that for you with this method. Don't think you can just watch this method, understand it, and then tomorrow know how to directional air roll. No, because that's disrespecting your whole body, your brain, your fingers. Just because you understand something with your brain doesn't mean your muscles do. So if you're actually smart, you're going to give yourself just a little bit of time so that your body manages to tag along, per se. All right? So train hard on something that someone else tried to find a smart way to work with, like I did, but yet do train hard. Working hard is being a warrior. Work the hell out of directional air roll and any other mechanics for that matter, but don't rely entirely on empiricism. Instead, use a method like mine or another one as soon as someone else will create another that is as honest as i claim mine to be and work hard on that method the method is smart now you go and put in the work you have to again don't follow those gurus who say don't work hard work smart because those people in reality don't want you to succeed ever they don't want you ever to have the same level they have. Otherwise, you would not need them anymore. And if they're so-called coaches on social medias, the only reason they do that is because they want you to pay for their coaching lessons. So don't be a sheep to those gurus. Those people love that you do not succeed because they love that you depend on them so that you feel like you're never good enough, that you're never enough without them. Don't depend on those people. Depend on your own will to get better and understand what you're doing. Just because it's brain racking does not mean it's not understandable. Many people will know which YouTube I'm referencing here, but don't listen to those people. Be self-sufficient in a smart, hardworking way because yes, of course, you can do both. Like everything in life has a method. Like from learning how to play an instrument to learning how to draw to learning how to code and we can continue this list even in daily tasks like cooking everything or basically everything let's not go to extremes here is done with a method so working hard with only experience as a teacher is as stupid as only working smart do both learn hard in a methodic way number 14 do also keep in mind that, as I said, a method is just one concept of an idea. Someone else might very well build another method that might suit you more as far as explaining or even combos or an understanding of movement is concerned. I just hope that whoever does it loves the game and teaching at least as much as I do and tries to put the necessary time, however crazy long it may seem, to explain everything they know in depth if that's what they claim to do. Number 15. Do not be silly. Car control comes before ball control. We're trying to learn how to air roll 
Of course, car control comes before ball control. How would you manage to control the ball in the air if you can't control your car in the air? Easy step, but I still said it. Number 16. This method was specifically made for PC and controller players. If you play on K&M, if you're on console, the concepts presented in this video are still made to be translated to your own gameplay. Now, I can't do Cyanic's job, especially if they don't pay me, and present to console players some maps or ways to translate custom maps helpfulness, but you can do it yourself as the notions I chose are translatable, such as tempo and rhythm and constants. They are translatable to anyone. Now, I did my best, but it might so happen that my best cannot ever be enough, even though I did try. Number 17. Feedbacks need to be felt then recognized, then known, then controlled, then played with or manipulated, such as constants need to. And given that constants give you feedback, if you do your constants correctly, your feedback also will be built correctly. Make sense? Yes, it does. Number 18. I have thought about the fact that naming this with my game attack can be pompous, but in the end, no one has done it yet. It took me a long time. This is not an eight minute or 15 minute video claiming to be an exhaustive thing. It's a one hour and a half thing. It's a one hour and a half thing. Obviously. I'm claiming to be as much exhaustive as I can make it. So far from me to be that much of an egocentric douche, I will allow myself that little pleasure. It's important to reward yourself sometimes. Number 19. The clips that you've seen here may not be very good nor very mechanical. In fact, I'm neither good nor mechanical. But I know about directional air roll. Now take this into consideration whether you're new at the game and can't air roll or your GCN consider the clips to be shit. Uh, I don't claim my clips to be good, and my clips don't claim to be anything close to freestyling. They are about air roll. They don't have all a perfect setup. They don't even all have a setup to start with. They're here to show I can do it, and here to support what I talk about. If you're better than me naturally, if you have more talent than I do, it's all the better reason to use this talent to profit. With that comes your work. Good? Hello everybody, Losvel here. I've started this method in 2021. It took me nine months to write it. Then I started editing it. Uh, last year is July of 2022. So it's almost been a year since uh, I've started editing it. We're back here today for the last chapter of the method, the exercises. So how's this gonna work? We're going to have fun doing a few exercises and I'm going to ask you to do them at home at least 30 minutes per day for at least one week and you should see some results. I've been streaming now on TikTok and Twitch for about four months and I've been teaching my method to quite a few people actually. In general, if you learn air roll by yourself, it should take you about 100 hours in about a month. If you learn it with my method, it should take you about two weeks, two weeks and a half in about 30 to 50 hours so it's quite a good result and i'm quite happy with it so today we're going to see the exercises that you already know because it's all of the exercises we're going to do are things that we've seen in the method now i'm going to translate sometimes for right air roll users as uh, i'm left air roll and that's what i'm used to doing all right so let's go the first exercise is going to be this one Tornado spin into a reverse tornado spin at each revolution. Now, if you do it correctly, you should go straight because we now know that tornado spin and reverse tornado spin are not directional inputs. So you should be going straight when you do that. The point of this exercise is to teach you about tempo. So to do your inputs at the, at the beginning of the revolution. All right, that's the first exercise. What's the second exercise going to be? It's going to be getting your car vertical, tapping boost. Yes, I said that one should always press boost constantly, but for this exercise, we're gonna tap boost and we're gonna air roll 
and then we're going to make one input down, one input up. This exercise is going to be divided into three phases. Three phases, yeah? The first phase is just to make one quick directional input. One, one, one at each revolution, as such. The second phase is just holding the input for one half of a revolution. So, one half, one half, one half, one half, one half, all right? Just like this. That's the second phase, the second stage, if you will. Notice that every time I'm keeping an input on my joystick, I'm pressing boost. And if I'm keeping the input, I'm keeping pressing boost. All right. Now, the third phase is just like the first exercise, but with directional input. So one revolution each. All right. Now, what we're going to do is that at every time we add an exercise, we're going to do all of the exercises quickly vertically. All right. So that was the second exercise. The third exercise is going to be the clocks. So if you're a left arrow user, you're going to start from far right and do a clock. One clock per revolution. You can do it without boosting. And if, if your camera changes, it means that you would have turned. If your camera does not change, it means that you would have gone straight. Okay, so clock. And if you go too much to the left like me, what does that tell you? That tells you that I should have calibrated more. But we'll get back to calibrating. All right. Clocks. All right. Now, let's try double clocks. Two clocks. One, two, one, two, one, two per revolution. One, two, one, two, one, two. The double clock is easier because the margin for error is is uh, smaller. Why? Because you're making inputs quicker, which means that there is less time for you to mess it up. If I start doing clocks again, see, I'm messing it up a little. So double clocks. We're not going to do triple clocks here because I don't I don't see any value in doing that for the exercise. You really don't use triple clocks when you're flying. You're going to use triple clocks when you're doing rings map, all right? But not when you're flying in this mode. So now that we have our first three exercises, we're going to do all of them vertically, quickly. So tornado spin, reverse tornado spin, tornado spin, reverse tornado spin. Now, first phase of the second exercise, and if you mess it up, that's okay. Just go back down and start again. So first phase of the second exercise, second phase. I mean, phase, not phase. And finally, the third phase with a whole revolution as such. Notice that I'm using up and down inputs and not the inputs relative to the tornado spin because that's just how I'd rather do it. All right, good. Now, the fourth exercise is going to be Lock and clock. Lock a vector and clock it. Lock a vector and clock it. So here I'm using upright and down, down right, but I could be using up and down. I do up and I do down. Lock and clock, again, is not really how you turn. Locking and clocking is just here to make you consciously do some feedback loops as as soon as you can in your training not even in your training in your learning uh in your learning phase right so locking and clocking is just here to make you use feedback loops on top of directional inputs all right good now we do all of the exercises quickly and vertically so first exercise, notice that I'm managing my boost here, but you, you don't need to do that. Right, second exercise, first phase, one quick input. So up, down, up, down, good. Second phase of the second exercise, half a revolution. Good, and third phase, a whole revolution. 
Now we quickly do clocks and double clocks. So one clock, one double clock, one clock, one double clock. Good. And now we're going to lock and clock vertically as much as we can. And if you crash, that's all right, mate. Lock and clock, lock and clock, lock and clock. Good, good. All right. After locking and clocking comes calibrating. So quickly, we're going to calibrate here, 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 here. So between 25 and 50 percent out of the rev of the revolution, I'm going to put my joystick in a tornado spin fashion, right? And I'm going to hold it in between 25% and 50% of the revolution, which is between here, here, and here. All right? So calibrate just like that. Very simple. All right? A bit more. Calibrate, calibrate, calibrate. Good. Now I'm going to do all of the exercises vertically again. So tornado, reverse tornado. Tornado, reverse tornado. Now, first phase of the second exercise, one small input, one small input, one small input, one small input. Now, the second phase, it's going to be half a revolution. If you do this correctly, you should be going straight because you're cancelling all of the inputs. And then the third phase, which is one revolution, one revolution, one revolution, one revolution, one revolution. All right, cool. Now we go to the clocks. One clock, one double clock. Nice. One clock, one double clock. Good. Now lock and clock. Lock and clock. Again, lock and clock. And I still want to do it here, lock and clock. See, I just held my input up and i just waited for one revolution and then i almost one revolution then I, then i locked so lock and clock lock and clock good and then we're going to calibrate vertically so we're going to tap boost here and we're going to calibrate all right again boom and boom and boom, and boom. All right, cool. Now the last exercise that we've seen, which is an air dribble into musty double tap. I'm kidding. No, the last exercise is going to be the reverse clock. So reverse clock starting from down, as such. Now reverse clock starting from up, so I'm gonna go vertically. I'm gonna go vertical and then do the reverse clock. Vertical, do the reverse clock. But now, as you know, the truth about turning is both giving it directional inputs at, input at the beginning of the revolution, but also keeping inputs going during the revolution. That's why the reverse clock is here. Now, you're going to notice two things, as we've seen. There are two speeds. Now, uh, for the reverse clock, there's the slow speed and there's the fast speed. The slow speed is going to make you turn. So if I go down right up down right up this should make me go to the left because i'm starting with a down input which is a input that makes me go left right so if i do it slowly i'm going to turn right good now if i just do it a little bit quicker here's what's going to happen i'm going to go vertical we've seen that but now we want to do it consciously all right and i want you to do it consciously so do it do it quicker and the second half of the reverse clock is just the opposite. Instead of going down, right up, we're going to go top, left, down. So if I go top, left, down, slowly, I go, I turn to the right. All right. If I do it slowly, it's not slowly, it's slowly enough. If I do it slowly enough, I'm going to go right. But now if I do it much faster, I'm going to go for, uh, horizontal, right? Horizontal. It's the opposite as, as uh, this one. Right? Good. Now we're going to do all the exercises. So, tornado spin, reverse tornado spin. First phase, then, of the second exercise. First phase, boom, boom, 
boom, boom. Second phase, half a revolution. So half a revolution, half a revolution, half a revolution. Good. Now full revolution. Good. Now clocks and double clocks. Clocks and double clocks. Good. Now we're going to go lock and clock. Lock and clock. Lock and clock. Good. Now we're going to need to calibrate. Boom. 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 Good. Now we're going to do, we're not, we're not even going to bother with the whole reverse clock. We're more interested in the two halves of the reverse clock, yeah? So we're just going to go s s slow speed, turning left and turning right. And faster speed, going vertical and going horizontal. All right? You can actually just have fun trying to, trying to get vertical and horizontal again. So I'm going vertical, horizontal, vertical, horizontal. All right? Good. Now, one last thing that I want you to do is to add to all of this the other combos. Remember, remember the combos? Uh, right, left, right, left, up, down, diagonals. The combos are essentially other feedback loops, just like the clock. The clock is a conceptualization a tangible conceptualization of a feedback loop. So it's going to make you go straight and it's going to give you feeling with your car, right? So you can do this around the exit, either at the end of everything or during the exercise number three, which is the clocks. So instead of doing clocks, what you want to do is just go right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, 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 just like that. All right and try to get a feel of the car. That's the most important thing. Trying to get a feel for the car, all right? Same thing with up and down. But if you don't do it, if you don't do it fast enough, you're going to turn. So you really have to be fast with this one. See, so I'm not being precise. I'm, I don't, I'm not meaning to make this. I mean to do this, but I'm going very fast with my joystick, so. It appears like I'm not doing it when actually that's what I want to do. So don't freak out. All right. So you just want to add this to all of the exercises, just combos, feedback loops. All right. The point of all of these exercises are to consciously make you do phenomenons that happen in game when you actually air roll. So we want to help muscle memory build itself. And instead of relying as muscle memory as the only tool we now have knowledge and we have practical exercises that will make make it so muscle memory and empiricism is not the only tool you have while learning how to use directional air roll. Good? Good. So once you've done all of these exercises the same way that I did them, you should start trying to have fun and trying to mingle to mix up all of those exercises vertically. Because when you're going to start learning how to air roll, you're going to fly like this. You're not going to fly like me during a rings map horizontally. You're going to fly vertically, all right? You're going to fly vertically. And when you start, you're going to make one input per revolution. But the better you are and the better you are at reverse clocks, the more you're going to mix up things, all right? So what I want you to do now is to do this exactly. Just mix those exercises up. For instance, I'm going to go vertical, up, down for one revolution. I'm going to go up, clock, and then I'm going to calibrate. There we go. Then I'm going to do one reverse clock. Reverse clock. See, I did it very slowly here so that I would turn. Another reverse clock. I'm going to go to the ground. <laughs> and again, you want to mix those things up. So clock, up, clock, feedback loop. All right. And you, even if you crash, it's all right. We're not here to be perfect. We're here to learn. Yeah. So just mix those things up. All of the phenomenon slash combos that we've seen slash exercises that we've just seen i want you to do them 
and mix them up a little. Have fun with them. So I'm going to go horizontal, vertical, tornado spin, clock. Oh, it was too late. So down, up into clock. And I'm going to calibrate. I'm going to go clock, down clock, down clock again. So lock and clock, basically. Lock and clock here again. I'm going to calibrate. I'm going to do one one uh, reverse clock. All right, so just have fun with these things. All right, these exercises should be done in the same order that I've given them. All right, because I believe I've given them from really the easiest to the hardest. It's going to be easier for you to do the second exercises, this one, rather than a reverse clock. Because in order to calibrate and do reverse clocks, well, the truth is, it's more advanced. Yeah, you're going to have to be used to what rhythm is, what rhythm is, what what the, what the tempo is, and feel a bit more comfortable with your joystick. By the way, calibrating is just an introduction to reverse clock. So calibrating is something in itself. When I do rings map, sometimes I tell my stream, hey, I just calibrated. And I literally, I, was, uh, I would be flying like this and I would calibrate and I would tell my, my viewers, hey, I just calibrated, right? But it's also an introduction to the reverse clocks, this, all right? Just like this exercises that we did in the method, when you go up and here, so when you do the directional input into calibrating, well, what is this? Tell me what this is. Yeah, that's a reverse clock, all right? Upright into calibrating is a reverse clock in left air roll, obviously. In right air roll, it's upright into, into calibrating to the right. But calibrating, so it's something in itself, right? But it's also an introduction to a more advanced way of flying, which is using your whole joystick. Okay? Good. Well, I think we, we're set here. You have all of the exercises. Do them at least 30 minutes per day, just for one week, and, and see how it goes. Yeah, because you, su you should see some changes, I guarantee you. Well... Um, I'm going to leave you with the last point of the method, which I actually wrote and recorded about one, one year and a half. One and a half year ago. Well, English, Jesus. So um, it was a pleasure doing this method. If you'd like to see me stream, well, I stream every Thursday at 10 p.m. European time. And I teach my method in French. But if a few English speakers come here and there, I'll probably do another stream during the week only in English. All right. I hope you liked it. Um, I'm going to miss this. This took me a lot. This took me nine months to write. It's a 27 pages long uh, Word document. The editing is about one year old. So I really hope... I could help you with that, and I really hope you enjoyed it as much the content as much as the thought process behind it. Now, this is going to be the last point. It's number 20 because I like things to be neat, and I'm going to repeat myself with it. Keep in mind that you will not manage to do this in one day. Obviously not. It takes training, but it'll never, ever, ever take you as long as you thought it would take you if you use my method. I am confident about it. If anything, you might even learn it faster than I could ever imagine. But please, for the love of God, remember that you are learning something new, something complicated, and that your brain has to sponge it up. We are dealing with mechanical issues. Your brain will take its own time to deal with it. You are not stupid and you do not suck because you don't manage to do it yet. What is going on actually is that when you mess it up, you are learning to be better for tomorrow. So every time you fuck things up, mate, Listen to me, mate. It's getting personal now. Listen to me, mate. Every time you fuck things up is the best version of you so far. So every time you fuck things up, you're working for tomorrow. And tomorrow, you won't fuck that thing up again. Or you will understand something about it. Yeah? Good. Tomorrow, you will be better. 
And this is the least thing you want to take for granted or ignore. It's not just a sentence. It is what will happen. This game is not chess, except the fact that your body, obviously your hands, finger and hand-eye coordination, is what's at work. We're not trying to be smart players here. Let's leave that to the people who specialize in strategy. Here, we're building our hand-eye coordination and some weird part of the game to get some muscle memory. Today, you suck ass. Tomorrow, you'll be able to do what you didn't do today. I'll never be able to stress that enough. You won't get this by tomorrow, but you might get it within the month. Do you realize? Within the month, mate. Please do not underestimate this whole paragraph or you will eventually give up. When had you given yourself a few more days, something would have clicked. Because that's how learning is. Rocket League and directional air roll and all the mechanics. Everything that is mechanic in life that needs mechanics and skill is a great teacher. Okay? You train your ass off. You blame and you rant and you shout and you throw your controller and then you go get a new one at 70 fucking bucks. But without knowing why, the next day you pick it up, check if it's broken. Nice it's not because it's a new 70 bucks one. You go into free play and suddenly you're controlling your clock. You get it. The next few days as you're learning to master it and now that you can control it, you realize, okay, I get what he says when he says that. I feel the need to calibrate in there. Then you start calibrating. And then all of a sudden you understand because you feel and you've learned how to feel how to get your damn car pointing to the right when it appears to be stuck to the left. Every day and every time you're assimilating something, you're failing. It's normal and it's nothing but great. This means that as you live out your day, your brain is still working on it. Every time you fail, you're feeding your brain. It seems like it's telling you that it's not hungry or that it doesn't want that kind of food. But that is your perception. That's your interpretation of it because all you can see is the result when the result is not the end. In learning, it's not the end. The, the, the end of learning is the result and the understanding and the will and the satisfaction and, and, and the discipline. It's all about this. It's about all of those things. All right? So listen to me closely again, mate. Every time you fuck up while learning... You're feeding your brain a spoon of success for tomorrow. Hopefully the intention I'm filling in this idea goes through your computer screen. And after some dedicated time, holy motherfucking shit, it's a Rocket League miracle. Now you go tell your friends so we can all play together. And please don't forget, as soon as you're comfortable with directional air roll, to comment how long it took you to use it, using my method, obviously. I would very much like to hear that. Good. All right, so I'm still going to keep to try your morale up. Know that you will know how to use directional air roll before you learn how to play the violin, before you win your first marathon, before you get a diploma, before hen have teeth. If I'm releasing this in March, know that you will know directional air roll before the summer, before any other example I could find. And I think I'm done with example, actually. So my video is long. This shit seems unreachable. But if you just dive into directional air roll, I promise you, you will not ever want to come back. The worst thing you could do is discourage yourself because on a specific day, you lack motivation. Mate, you're fucking human. This shit happens. You're going to have some low days in general, like we all do. But don't fall for it. And don't also procrastinate too much. But do take breaks. It means your brain is telling you, all right, I'm not quite there yet, mate. But tomorrow, man, actually, probably tomorrow, I'll feel good about it. Right? That's what your brain tells you when you want to take a break. Like, you're literally digesting everything. So, play the game as you normally would, while inside your head, something is being forged. Like, something is actually being forged. Alright? Good. And boom goes the abrupt ending so that this motivation speech stays with you as long as possible. I hope you can find this method relevant, both in the information provided as well as the thought process that allows it to be put into words. Now, thanks for watching, mate, for listening, for being patient. 
Good luck. Don't forget to have fun because nothing is done well without fun. Ranked games are not a live or die answer to anything, nor the only sources of pleasure or confidence in this magnificent game. Psionics, if you listen to this somehow, because I'm nobody, uh, the ball is in your court. And to whoever watched this video, I will see you around, mate. Take care.